Okay, so what am I going to talk about today besides myself and Addition Financial? Um, through our partnership, we have learned a lot about the students and the questions when they do ask questions about finances, simple basic finances. And that's what I'm going to go over today because these are stuff, this is stuff that me and you know. Right? Adults know this. You'd be amazed how much students don't actually know. I go over a little bit of account basics and essentials, going to touch on that quick, and then the basic checking savings account where their direct deposit will go. Some students don't even know what direct deposit is just yet or how to take advantage of it. Right? So the fees, um, what to look for when you, you're going to get a membership. I'm not here just to talk about credit unions being amazing. I have a bank account as well. I always tell someone to have a bank and a credit union account is good. Um, I'll touch that in section one. And then I'll go over a little bit about the last two that most college students don't know at all. Is there a credit score? Because they, they don't know what goes into it. They don't know much about it, so they don't worry about it. And they don't know how much it actually affects them, especially once they finish up school. And then I go over budgeting, because budgeting is fun, and I love talking about it. And it's also the simplest thing to do, to have a little bit more financial freedom, have control over your finances, and of course it releases stress. The number one most stressful thing, at least in my life, is my, ma no, I'm kidding, is my finances. Not my marriage. I actually married a year tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much. That is an accomplishment I am very proud of. <laughs> so uh, one year in. But anyway, credit unions versus banks. Does everyone here know what a credit union is? Don't be shy if you don't. I will not be offended. Sir in the back, I know you know what a credit union is because you should, remember you showed me your card before? We shared that moment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we do appreciate your membership. Do you like the name change? Do you like the name change? Perfect. I'll take it. <laughs> we are member owned. So just like I said before, we just rebranded and we got a state charter, right? So each person that's a member had voting rights for that. They got a yes or no in the mail. Did you get a yes or no? Yes, we did. Yeah, you have, a, you have voting rights. You are a part owner of the credit union. Even though we are not for profit, not non for profit, we're not for profit. They had to pay amazing employees like myself and keep the lights on. But we are, we are member owned. We do have a board. It's not a paid board, but we do have a board. And we, our members are also part of that ownership. And you have voting rights attached to it. We actually have, we actually have a uh, annual meeting every year where our members are invited to join, sit in. They have yay or nay rights, which is pretty funny. Because everyone's like, yay. Or, and then like nay, like you always see in the movies. And then um, we have two people show up for that out of a, tens of thousands of members. So if you guys want to join and come, that would be nice. Um, and there's a big one right here. We're, we are um, funded by NCUI or we're insured. Up to 250000 by NCUA. There's a question I get a lot. Banks are what? FDIC, right? Same dollar amount as a bank. This affects me and un doesn't affect me. It affects me in the sense that I'll never have over $250,000 in the bank. So I won't have to worry about um, not being insured for a certain dollar amount. It's also positive for me because I always have under $250,000 in the bank and I know that money's insured. But credit unions, all credit unions are insured up to the same dollar amount that you would get with any type of bank. Here's some stuff we have in common. It's just a basic everything. We offer the same type of products banks do. Students get their online mobile banking just like they would with the bank. Um, they still have their full service branches, tellers, branch managers, uh, personal bankers. You get your credit cards, your ATMs, your loan products, everything that you get at the credit union, you do get with the bank. I will say this for credit unions as a plus, even though I'm employed by them. And this is all credit unions, not just addition financial. When a credit union has a good year, or even when they don't have a good year, you will find interest rates on loan products are lower. I promise you that between all credit unions that I know of than normal um, your commercial banks. Now, surely there will be promotions at banks where you'll find a 1.99 in auto loan for a short period of time. But I, uh, with credit unions, that's why I always tell people, if you have a bank account, let's say with Chase Bank, who I, who's my other bank account outside my credit union, and you're not getting feed, no minimum balance, we direct deposit, all this other stuff, and you're happy with it, that's fine. But there will be a time when you need to refinance your car, or you want a new car loan, or you want a mortgage. And with a loan, you want that customer service, right? Always look at credit unions. Fairwinds, McCoy, us, Mid-Florida. This isn't a shout out just to Addition Financial. For students as well, they don't understand how important an interest rate is attached to their loan. They apply for a car loan. They don't get the difference of a five-year and a seven-year loan. They could all, uh, we could all afford a Maserati in this room. We're just paying for it for 12 years. Right? That's what I find with students a lot is they're like, well, I have my budget. I can afford this much a month with a car loan. So originally, they'll get that five-year offer. It's above what they can afford a month, and they'll just stretch it out over seven years. They got that interest rate for a long time. So interest rate is important. When a, when a student has a question about a loan or they want some type of membership, not just 
don't always point them towards credit unions. This isn't supposed to be a plug for that. But I, I am saying that to have that knowledge that credit unions do offer lower interest rates and they are in better hands is um, something that they'll benefit from because they will have the opportunity to get a lower interest rate. We all know banks, I won't go over all those bullet points. They are open to the general public. That's a huge plus. If I go to California, I know there's a chase on every single street that I go on, right? I would say there's a chase at every single state, but it's every single street at this point. Um, they are public companies. So when a bank has a good year, their shareholders benefit from it. Not that it's a bad thing, because everyone, you know, they should be investing in some kind. And people that are shareholders in banks, you want them to succeed because you want to do well on, on your shares, correct? So that's not a bad thing. That's not there to, to say banks are, are bad because they're public companies. It's just they're different than credit unions. And these are the main differences. All these slides, by the way, are open to everyone in the room. I did not print them because for some reason they were only coming on color on my printer, and that's a lot of vivid blue. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Perfect. I think I sent them to Ken already. So then they're good. Yeah. Perfect. Account basics. This is the basic stuff that goes into account. Some students know it, some, some don't. There's going to be fees attached to their accounts. They'll need to know what documents are required, proof of residency, sometimes their college ID. Um, where the interest rates attached to their accounts, and what, uh, what are your benefits of other, what's the benefits of other financial institutions? All basic stuff that goes into an account opening. Um, obviously, one of the things when a student does go to look for a financial institution is just simple research, right? Google works. Google's like a verb now. Like I'm going to Google today. Google most of the day. Besides work, I'm going to Google. Uber. Um, here's just a step-by-step -step process of what students need to open an account. We all know this. If a student comes to us with a question like this on what they would need to open an account or what the process is, um, I think everyone in this room, if you have a question on this, please let me know, knows how to handle opening an account. Yes, sir. Can you open an account online with your institution? Yes, you can. You can. So that student that would have to actually do the whole process online? They can. So this is what I recommend with students, though, specifically with our partnerships. They can do it online. They will not get the promotion because the computer does not recognize that. They, they will get the college account and all the logistics of it. But the $50 promo, they would not get. So they can definitely do it online. Anyone can open it, even on a mobile app. I always say it's worth a trip, especially if you're opening up a membership. I touch on this a little bit, so I'll skip over when I get to that point for the sake of time. But you want to create a relationship with your financial institution, the people that work in that branch. Why would you want to do that? Well, I'll tell you. Not everyone at once. When you have a personal relationship with the people that work in that branch and the time comes that you are going to apply for some type of loan product, you don't want to sit down with someone that is going to put you in some type of loan or interest rate as they're going to benefit them and their goals. You want someone that kind of knows you on a personal level. So in some situations, you may be putting yourself in a poor choice financially, and they may say, this isn't the right thing for you. Now, if you come addition financial, you don't even need to have a relationship, because we would definitely tell you the right thing for you. Remember that. But all seriousness, you want to build some type of relationship with the people in the bank. That personal relationship, so they're not just using you to reach some type of sales goal. Okay. <sighs> Complications on account. This is interesting. And this happens a lot with college students. It happened with me. Quick story, I had an LA Fitness membership. As you can tell, I never went. Everyone laughs at that joke. They laugh at my physique. That's fine. They laugh at my expense. They took my account number to open that membership. So even if I changed my debit card, they were taking out a monthly payment from me every single time. OK? I said, after three courtesy pay fees, so $30 membership, didn't have money in the account, got hit with another $35 because the bank funded it for me, so I'm owing $65. If my math is correct, and it has to be because I work for Addition Financial, I have to know how to add. Okay? Take that one out of the rotation. I'm bombing today. Jeez. Um, I, I, I just never funded the account. I left it. I got hired by a credit union in New York as my first job, and I wanted to open up an account with them. What happened? Can't do it. I hit check systems. Couldn't open an account with them. They said no, which was very embarrassing. That history doesn't go away. And this happens to students a lot because they get hit with courtesy pay. Right? They're like, I don't want to pay. Even adults, too. I mean, the amount of money financial institutions make on the courtesy pay fee alone is, in, is a very large number. Um, so you, don't, you, don't want, you want to make sure you pay back any insufficient fund fees, but know that it sticks with them. 
Okay, they won't be able to open up an account with a normal financial institution if they owe money to another one. That sticks with them. It's called check systems. Here's some account essentials. Here's some. Oh, was that bad? <laughs> so, what are students doing these days, or most people? All online, right? So, I didn't bring this up, but there's banks and credit unions, and what's the other type of financial institution that's very popular now? Online. online. I was dealing with a gentleman at UCF. We're going to have a branch in the downtown campus. And he goes, oh, well, that's awesome about your name change. I, I don't have a branch with my financial institution. I do everything online. Which is cool because his interest rate on his savings account is actually a normal interest rate on his savings account like he used to be. Why? They don't have overhead. So they're offering great savings uh, interest rates on savings accounts. Which is not, I don't think, a bad thing. If you're using a savings account to sit there for a while and you want that interest rate, it's not the worst thing in the world. I would not use that in my normal financial institution. But the point I'm making is everything is online. People rarely pop into a branch. Right? I don't even pop into an additional financial branch. No, I'm kidding, I do, because I'm building that relationship. Here's one of the most important things, I think, that we should talk about on this slide. Bill pay. Who, does, who uses bill pay? Why do we use bill pay? No, because I can schedule the exact date the money comes out. Absolutely. And even better, my institution doesn't take the money out until the check is cashed mm -hmm. by the person that sent it. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to the sent date, it actually is, it's, I can guarantee the receipt date and the money doesn't credit or doesn't deduct until the payment withdrawal comes through. That's a great answer, Daniel. And you pretty much said this, but if I wanted my bill pay to pay a bill on the first Tuesday of every month, could I do that? Yeah. yeah. I could set it up to whenever I want to do it. And it'll automatically make that payment for me. So what happens when students graduate, they get their job, they have their career, what comes along with that just naturally? Bills. Bills. Nobody can stay on top of bills just on their own. You've got seven to ten bills you have to pay, cable, water, electric, and then you forget your car bill and the tow truck's taking your car out of the driveway and all the neighbors are watching. Not that that has happened to me. Um, it is impossible to stay on top of bills. Bill pay resolves that problem for you and it's very user friendly and easy to set up. What other reason is bill pay important? No stamp. No stamp. No, no stamp. I mean, I very love, true. I love Bill pays the rest. No stamp, no envelope, no, you, know, you don't have to remember. And actually, even now, we have very good ones. We, use, we pay, like the rest of you, Orange County Utilities. I don't know uh, where you pay. But even if it's a variable amount, it will come through. Yeah. Because that's the newest piece. I know for a while, you could only use fixed amounts in Bill Pay. Now, now if you, you have like a cable or water. Bill. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big problem that was with Bill Pay. Yes. Yeah, you do get those, absolutely. And, the, and other companies love you using bill pay because it pretty much locks up that they're going to get their payment. Unless you don't have courtesy pay, you go negative and then. Um, but what, is, what do you avoid also doing? Let's say you didn't have bill pay, you missed a payment. What happens? Affects your credit score. Who here knows what the largest portion of their credit score is and what that percentage is? Payment history is 35% of the pie chart for, you, for your credit score. It is the most important thing. It affects it the absolute most. When you have bill pay, you avoid missing a payment. Okay, so this leads into my credit score slide in the end. But this, I think, out of everything on that slide, all the other stuff is cool that you could do with online banking, but bill pay is something people should take the hour or two hours and take advantage of it. Boom, check and savings accounts. That is a lot of text on that. Um, this is what you get with checking accounts. We all know this. Bill pay is on there. Direct deposit benefits. There we go. So I don't charge students for minimum balance or addition financial doesn't. There is financial institutions that do. If you bring your direct deposit, or if students bring their direct deposit over to a financial institution, have this simple conversation. If they're getting feed, a minimum balance with their direct deposit going in there, or if they're just getting feed a monthly maintenance fee, which nobody should be getting that fee, period, because financial, there's financial institutions outside of credit unions that offer that. They shouldn't have a minimum balance fee. Financial institutions now will throw you $300, $500 to bring your direct deposit over to them. They want to be your primary financial institution. So if students are looking for a financial institution, or if, even if anyone in this room is looking for another financial institution, and they're bringing the direct deposit over, they should not be getting a minimum balance fee. They should waive a majority of your fees because you are choosing them as your primary financial institution. They're getting your paycheck every week, every other week. This is basic stuff. This is your everyday basic checking and savings account, right? So you've got to get this right because this is where your normal um, this is where your everyday paycheck is going into. Your hard-earned money is going into this account. Even if you use your car credit card for your normal purchases and this money is just there to pay off your credit card bills, this is the base, most basic thing in banking. So you want to be comfortable with who you choose to do it with. We all know what goes into a checking account, but why is this important? It's because of overdraft protection and courtesy pay. 
Talked about it a little bit already. Questions to ask about courtesy pay and overdraft protection. How long do I have to fund my account before I get that $35 fee? Sometimes it'll be 24 hours, sometimes it'll be towards that Friday, and sometimes it's too bad you're getting the $35 fee. Legally, people have to check yes or no for courtesy pay or overdraft. Okay, so they should make that decision before they go in there, but they should also ask these questions because it could change potentially their decision. But this is something that kills people on their normal checking savings account is this fee, it's $35, that's a large amount. If that happens to them three times a year, that is $105. Yes, it's $105, correct? I mean, yeah, it's 105, I did it twice, that's 105. Addition financial. That's adding, folks. That is adding, and that's why I'm here for you. <laughs> but this is the students that don't have a credit card yet, which they shouldn't, and I'll touch on that in a second. This is what will hurt them. This is what their check systems, um, money that they'll owe that'll come out of their direct deposit when it hits. They could owe $60, uh, $70, and boom, that takes out of a large check of their paycheck. So they should know if they want overdraft or uh, courtesy pay or overdraft when they apply for an account. What's the one example that would be good? I have bill pay, or I have, I have let's say, um, progressive car insurance, and I have them taking it out of my account. I don't have enough money in the account to pay the bill, um, and I don't have courtesy pay. Bill's blocked. Progressive's going to charge me $35 most likely, and then I missed a payment. What's the largest portion of uh, my credit score? Payment history. So in that situation, that could work. If I'm stuck in the panhandle, I have 200 miles to go to a gas station, courtesy pay. Could be helpful in that sense because I'm in an emergency. But that's something where if students have questions about their normal checking savings account, I think the biggest fee they have to worry about is courtesy pay. We all know what happens with monthly maintenance. They should be shopping around financial institution if they're bringing direct deposit over or find a college account that does not charge them a minimum balance or a monthly maintenance fee. But courtesy pay is the big one. They should know how it works and why to avoid it. The simple um, answer is to check their account every single day, which I think there's a slide on it, maybe not. Why else did everyone in Orlando, as a side note, check their account every single day? Fraud. We live in Central Florida. We're one of the top cities for, for fraud, right? The chips alleviated that problem a little bit, right? Because swiping, they have kind of figured out the encryption on that. Everyone was getting hacked, and now it's kind of, but people still, it still happens a lot. You check your account every day. They're going to leave a bread trail. So it's going to be a dollar, a dollar, and then boom, two grand out in Nevada. So that's how it works. It's like breaking into a home. I got to stop using this example because people think I break into homes. But you knock on the door twice, see if anyone's home, and then boom, you kick in the door, right? They're leaving a bread trail and say, oh, yeah, look, it looks like Mr. Barbary is in Nevada because he's making multiple purchases. And then boom, $1,000. To catch it right away, just turn your debit card off. They'll refund you that dollar purchase. They'll send you a new debit card in the mail. It's a little bit of a headache but you do avoid that problem. Okay, so that's why, that as a side note, is why you should be checking your account every single day. Okay, what do I got here? Don't make a purchase for the, if you know the money is not there. Oh, am I getting the uh, budget a little bit? Savings accounts. This is something we should teach students about savings accounts. One, you're not getting an interest rate, sorry. But what they should use that savings account for is automatic transfers from their checking into their savings account. So what are students not going to do on their own? They're not going to, yeah, they're not going to put the money into there for them. So what banks do now and credit unions is they will automatically do it for you. So I do, I do this, automatic transfers twice a, twice a month, and it's the two times I get paid. $20 every time, boom, goes into my savings account because I know I won't do it on my own. I'm building an emergency fund savings account. And it's connected to my checking account. It's connected to my checking account for a couple of reasons. One, I need that account to be liquid because I need access to that money because it's an emergency. Okay. Two, I want the automatic transfers. This account would just be for emergencies. So everyone in this room, when I talk, I use this savings account, I think it's the most important, but everyone in this room should save about three months to six months worth of what they spend a month, okay? Last class started booing me almost out of the room when I said that, because it sounds borderline impossible. Automatic transfers you could use for that as well. But I think students should start small and at least have $1,000 in, in a savings account for emergencies. They lose four tires. Uh, medical emergency. If they don't have that emergency savings account, what are they going to do to make sure they pay for that? Credit card. credit card. And that credit card is not going to get paid off the next month because they didn't have money for the emergency in the first place. Aut simple thing for savings accounts, automatic transfers. They'll forget after the first two months, I forget until I bring it up in this presentation every time, that I have automatic transfers. After the first two times, they'll totally forget. 
So they can start small as well. So just have the students start at $5. So they're in on it. They, they, they become comfortable with it. They're motivated to do it. It's all about motivation when it comes to savings because savings is extremely boring. But when they have that $1,000, they got that nice comma in their savings account, that's when the motivation kicks in. Right? We all like seeing that comma. I haven't seen a comma in either of my accounts for a very long time. I want to get back to that. How am I going to do that? Automatic transfers. Simple, simple little steps you can teach your students on how to save up for any type of emergency when it comes. Some other things you do with savings accounts. I already went over this bad boy. Research interest rates. That's for CDs and money markets. I mean, it, if students have some type of money, they get um, birthday checks in the mail or anything, their financial institution offers some type of CD rate. And when I made this bullet point, um, we had like a 2.54 for 10 month CD rate, which is pretty good for an interest rate for a CD because CDs are almost become non-existent like a normal interest rate on a savings account. Um, so, and I feel like people just don't have knowledge about CDs and money markets anymore. Um, I unfortunately don't go over it that much, but it's uh, there's something they should look out for because they want to earn more money on the money they're saving. Right? They should learn how interest rates do work on a savings account, so if they do see some type of promotion for something like that, they know they're earning 2.54 on whatever dollar amount they are putting in there, and they earn some money on it. Online budgeting tools, because I go over budgeting. Students don't get motivated for budgeting. They think it's Excel sheets. They think it's envelopes with cash in it, which it could be. Until I bring up the Mint app or how uh, your bank has or credit union has an online budgeting platform. Anyone here use Mint app or heard of it? Yeah, it's a, it's a free, the only reason I use this and not my Chase or Edition Financial one is I've been using Mint since college. It's free. You set up your line items how you like. It's extremely user friendly. You set up your card to the account. When I spend 20 bucks at Chipotle, it automatically goes right onto my fast food line item. No one ever asked me why I said I use 20, spend 20 bucks at Chipotle. Oh, I, what? No, I always eat by myself. I, my wife won't even go in public. It was good, yeah, exactly. Well, I was going to use it as a guacamole joke because there's old oh, people always say like, "Oh, the guacamole is expensive at Chipotle, huh?" <laughs> Let's move on. Um, savings accounts—they provide safety, and that safety, in a sense, is look at this guy. Something's wrong with his tires, and there's snow. We don't have to worry about this here. But he knows, even though he's not going to want to spend that money from his emergency savings account to pay for this, he can. And what's going to happen? He's just going to start rebuilding again because he's got automatic transfers. Something simple for a savings account. Yes, budgeting time. Here we go. This is the slide I like. Here's some myths that students have about budgeting, why they don't get involved. It means giving up on something or giving up something on. Wait, what? Budgeting means giving up on something. So one of the important things when a student makes a budget, they have questions, you want to get your student motivated to budget, is they pay for themselves. That has to be a line item. I always tell um, kids to make this simple when they do their budget. Um, take the first month once you have your first job, don't budget. Your normal purchases that you do every single day. After that month, you look at your summary. All right, and then you are wow, because you're, if, you're, if you're trying to budget the first month, you're going to try and be smart here and there. You're never really going to address the problem. Look, I spent $40 on Chick-fil-A in a month, wow, and that's the wow number for them. They'll know if they add everything up, what points they, they want to lower that dollar amount and how they can do that. Okay? And then they'll realize at the end, once they take care of their needs, their gas, their bills, things that you should not cushion, by the way. I mean, things that you should not tighten up. Why? Why shouldn't we tighten up bills? It's usually a set dollar amount. Like Dan was saying before, my cable bill changes, my water bill changes. Um, I don't want to miss paying a bill because I tightened it and my money went towards something else. So when it comes to bills, you want to cushion it. Had them make the budget small and easy to start with. One line item for bills, one line item for gas, food, pay themselves. As they move along, like now I got like 15 to 20 line items. It's getting kind of ridiculous. But I would not have been motivated to do budgeting in college or even after I got out of college if I had that many line items. Because it was simple for me to look at before I became a, kind of like a pro at it, um, I was motivated to do it because it didn't take that much work. I just knew that I spent this much of my budget so far this month. I have a week left. I'm done eating fast food. I'm going to grocery shop and make my own food. Okay, but now I know how every dollar amount, I know where it's going now. I'm not that old. Last class kind of guessed my age a little bit wrong, which is fine. I'm a little insecure about it, but I'll move on. I'm a big boy. I'm an adult. Not that much of an adult where I'm really old, but old enough to move on from it and not let it affect me for the rest of the day. 
because I'm here from 10. And the final financial education, if I'm still worrying about what people think, how old I am, um, is just going to hurt the people that attend. And I won't let that happen, because I'm here to talk about finances. And everyone's having a great time. Video guys are having fun. That's right. <laughs> um, number three, I'm too broke for bu to budget. So why should I? No one is too broke to budget. You don't have to be a millionaire to budget your money. If, if you think you're too broke to budget, then that means you should be budgeting more. If anything, you want to know where your money is going. Something is obviously wrong. <sighs> more about budgeting. I got the, uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, everyone should be saving for goals. People don't talk about this. When you go to get a new cell phone, no one budgets to pay for the cell phone. They just let that cell phone go on to their normal bill. So Sprint's like, oh, $35 a month for your phone bill. And then it's like $90 because the iPhone 12 costs uh, $60, my math is right. Um, that's an example of a short-term goal. If I know in two years Apple's going to update their phone and my Apple 5 is not going to work anymore, unfortunately, I could slowly start saving a small dollar amount do the timeline in my head. I got two years. If I save up this amount a month, I can afford a down, uh, uh, buying the phone in full and just paying for the service. This is just an example again. But then Apple's going to charge you $2,000 for a phone by those two years. So I should raise the dollar amount a little bit more because I know uh, Apple's inflation is just through the roof. Midterm goal, I want to make a down payment on a car. Right? The more of a down payment people make on a car, the less they pay a month. So I want to get myself into a healthy down payment. I want to start saving a little bit of money. I know in five years, I'm going to be ready to get a new car. I want it in a five-year loan. I don't want a seven-year loan and pay that much interest. Three to five-year loan. Let's shoot for a three-year loan. Minimum interest, higher monthly payment, but I'm going to get it paid off right away. Long-term goal. Everyone should have small types of savings accounts. And this is why I said internet banks are actually kind of pretty cool because you'll get a higher interest rate in your savings account. So you're earning a little bit more money back on the money that's, uh, that you're saving in that account. So, you know, everyone even now, not just for students, should have some type of goals. Everyone has a goal. I want to move into a home permanently eventually. Right? I need what? $20,000 down payment to do that. That's my long-term goal. In 20 years, I'm going to be able to do that. And I'm very excited for it. That joke should have done so much better than what you guys are giving me right now. That was a good joke. What? It's the end of the day. Yeah. Well, not for me. I just, just wait till the last class reacts to my jokes. <laughs> People are going to be getting up and just leaving like this could. Um, I put a slide in here about 401k. Have this conversation with your students about 401k. This is important. Have a conversation with your students about retirement. Because this is, should not be their only avenue for retirement. 401k is great because you'll have your employer match, and students should take advantage of this match. Right? A couple things they should also do. I read a study, I forget who it was, so I'm not making this up in my head, but someone in my age range, again, not that old, should be contributing 12% to their 401k. Okay? You can quote me on that if you want to look it up, but I'm pretty positive. Uh, no, I am positive that it was 12%. I'm at 10%. Additional financial um, matches 5% of what I contribute. So I do need to raise that, right? But the younger that they do this, the more riskier they could be with their 401k. There's more room for mistakes. And obviously, because it's a longer period of time, they're saving up more money. Other avenues is obviously their home. They, they, they have a home for their whole entire life once they get their job. They don't refinance that home. They're 65. They're married with kids. It's a glorious life for them. They sell that home. More money for their retirement. IRAs. Mutual funds, index funds, simple small funds to get started with. I'm using something now that is really simple. It's called the Acorns app. Anyone ever hear of the Acorns app? It's kind of like Bank of America's Keep the Change. I buy a cup of coffee. I'm from, from New York, so coffee sounds funny. But you guys didn't laugh, so it doesn't matter. 50 cents. They'll round that up to the nearest dollar. They'll take that 50 cents, and they invest it for me. It's just a small avenue I'm doing towards retirement. Because I, the way I'm living now, I somewhat want to live when I get older. I, I can't imagine what that will be like without some type of income coming in. Right? And that scare factor m makes me realize that I need to try and take advantage of my 401k as much as possible and continuously look for other avenues to make sure I'm saving for retirement. That's the only slide I have on retirement. But that's a conversation people should have. They should also ask their employers a couple quick questions. What type of fees are attached to this account yearly? How long do I have to stay employed with you to get this match? So if you don't work for Addition Financial, you leave before five years, they take their contribution back. People do not know this. Bobby Orlando, yes, his last name is Orlando. How cool is that? He deals with our website, Edition Financial. He just left, unfortunately. I'm going to miss him a lot. He's six foot five. We were two tall guys in the building. People would see us in the hallway and they'd run. They'd be like, oh, just look at these two. He left in September, would have been his fifth year. He, he had no idea. He lost Edition Financial's contribution. 
He didn't know. I'm like, well, how long have you been here? And he goes, uh, four years. I'm like, you're going to lose your contribution from addition. He gets his back, right? He'll get his back. But what, what addition was contributing, he will not get back. So that's a question everyone should have. Not a lot of people ask that question. It's an important little tidbit to have in your back pocket. Credit. I love credit. So when I was in college, I wasn't motivated for credit, nor did I care, no matter how much my parents told me. I didn't know what went into it, what I did wrong. I didn't care that I had, let's say, a uh, 610 credit score. Okay, I will bounce back to this slide. Um, until I learned the hard way, and this is the hard way right here. So Addition Financial doesn't do a background check or a drug test, right? I call up and move from New York. I'm like, when do I schedule this? Like, oh, no, we did a credit check on you. You're good. All right, cool. I guess I'll get started. Not that I'm a bad person. Nothing would have came up. But they do do a credit check. Pe it, Jobs will look at it just like a, a lender would look at it. Your risk, their risk if they have a low credit score. Credit score is your risk factor, that's your number. You won't get a loan or a low interest rate if they think you're a risk. Utilities and cell phones, cell phones run credit. We can't live life without cell phones, right? You even get a higher monthly payment on a cell phone because they're saying they may not pay me back every single month for the, the loan of the phone because they are loaning you a phone. It is a payment on it unless you save for a short-term goal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously your normal banking, rental opportunities. They, they move out, they finish college, they're ready to move away from home. They run your credit when, you, then when you're ready to rent. Fortunately, renting doesn't help your credit score, but they do run your credit score. They want to make sure you pay your rent. Students are getting very smart with this. So every seven years, something sitting on your credit score, it runs off in seven years. So someone thinks I'm in collections for six years, I'm going to wait it out because in seven years, that will fall off my credit score. And meanwhile, it takes seven years, it's eating away your credit score. So I mean, it, does, it definitely does its damage. What would happen for that not to happen? They sell the debt to another collections company, which happens a lot. Now, in some scenarios, yes, the other collections company will not take that risk because it took them six years. But if, there, if it's a um, $500 loan that you own, that, that, or $500 you owe collections, and they sell it to another collections for 40 bucks, some collections will say, we'll go out to them for $400 just for 40 bucks. So it does happen. Guess what? That seven years comes back up again. Okay, students have came smart to this. I don't recommend going this route. I actually thought about this when I was in school. I had three credit cards from college, and I racked all those bad boys up. I'm getting low on time, but this is an important picture if you want to take it. This is what's going into your credit score. One more thing I want to touch on credit cards with students, and it's important. I should have done it in the end, and I'm sorry I haven't. Secured credit cards. One of the biggest questions students ask is, I want a credit card and they want to know everything about it. it. Happens to me when I just simply table out at Valencia then. Point them in the direction of a secured credit card. Not every student has the opportunity to have a parent co-sign on a card for them and make payments for them. So they walk out with a 750 credit score. It happened to my wife. I hate, I hate her for every second of it. Because I walked out with my own credit cards that killed my credit. She just walks out with $750, uh, 750 credit score like it's perfect because daddy was paying her credit card bills. Whatever. We don't all have that luxury. Secured credit cards. We do have a great um, program for students. They put in 250 into the secured savings account. We will match the 250. They get a $500 secured card. They rack up that card in a month. They don't make the payment. What happens? We take the $500 out of that savings and we apply it to what the payment is. They are virtually not missing a payment, which is the largest part of their credit score. Okay, if a student ever asks a question about credit cards and it seems like they're motivated for it, or if they get into some type of credit card debt and they're applying online like crazy and they get in decline, which will affect their credit score, Point them in the direction of a secure credit card. It doesn't have to be through addition financial, just in general. What I also tell students is don't, you don't have to use it as like a monthly payment thing. Make a small purchase, pay it off right away. Just keep building that history of healthy payments. Okay, because that again is the most important thing. Yes, ma'am? Quick question. When do you think parents think should get a credit card for their child so they can start building up their credit? Oh, you're saying co signing? So, like your student, you'll get one for your son or daughter. Yeah. And they'll use it, and you'll make a pay. You'll pay it off. Can they, they could be younger than right? Yes, they could be younger than eight. No, 17 years old. I think they could apply for a credit card addition financial. But what I recommend is, if you do go that route, I mean, you got to be pretty strict with it. We're dealing with college students and a credit card. I mean, my wife, when she got her first credit card, it was a TJ. Who shops here at Marshalls? 
I mean, my wife, my wife, when she first applied credit card, was like, "Hi, ma'am, do you want to send ten percent, save ten percent on Marshalls?" First off, you're shopping at Marshalls. Ten percent off is not going to save you that much money. This isn't Neiman Marcus. My wife's like, "Yeah, sure, I got a 750 credit score. Give me that credit card." Then she's racking up on her Marshall purchases, right? So, yes, co-signing for a card and paying for your, your son or daughter is great, but they still haven't learned just yet, right? So that secure card just for them as well. On top of that helps them somewhat learn it on their own, right? And it'll be a low limit. Secure cards are a little bit of a low limit, so that's why it's important. Again, what goes into your credit score? If you could have that conversation with them, show them the dangers of it, what, how it could affect them, and just so they have a kind of like a financial grasp on uh, their choices and you know, what they do wrong is going to affect that number. When they get older, they will regret that. Here's credit scores. We're at this point, and I can say for District Financial, we're a credit union. This is almost like you're not getting a loan, and you're, get, you're getting a high interest rate. So I'm from 610, which is our normal credit score rate for Kissimmee, which is our most busiest branch. Some of them are getting turned away, which is crazy, right? Why does everyone get turned away? 2008 happened, right? No one wants to be giving out loans or mortgages for someone that really shouldn't be getting it. So they, they need to know that you, your life, you want to be in the good to excellent range. And who doesn't want to bring up that they have an 850 credit score, right? Isn't that pretty cool? I wouldn't know. Uh, tips for building credit. Again, access to my slides. Shout out Ken and the symposium team. Um, but here's a list of ways that people can build their credit up. I think the best way to start is to secure a card route. Right? They're learning while they're doing it. So when they do go for that credit card and they get a $500 or a $1,000 credit card, and they apply for a loan, they're proving they can handle some type of line of credit and make payments on it, right? And then once they get that car loan and a decent interest rate, that's going to jump their credit score even higher because they're proving they can handle this high of a payment through this many months. Rebuilding uh, credit, pay on, uh, pay on time every time. Again, that's credit score if you miss it. Um, keep the oldest accounts active. Who here has kept their credit card since when they started for a very long period of time? That is a good thing to do. If you have a five-year credit uh, car loan, that's a long period of time. If you're showing you can use a line of credit for a long period of time, that helps your credit score because when you apply for that car loan, they know that you're trustworthy with a line of credit and you can handle a long-term loan. <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. So, um, like if you have multiple credit cards, like mm -hmm. credit cards, uh, BMA. That will not affect your credit score if that's your risk. So if you have a credit card for a long period of time, it won't affect it. If you're balance transferring and closing cards back and forth like a ping pong ball, that will affect your credit score. Yes, ma'am. Uh, last thing, keep your balance low. Anything over 30% of a balance will hurt your credit score in a negative way. I have $10,000 limit credit card. I have $5,000 that I owe on it. That's affecting my credit score. It's over 30%. You want to keep it below that 30%. Any questions? Wow, I went through that quick. I, I ran a little bit behind. I do apologize, folks. No? This is what we offer. If you have any questions, ask me email. And I got business cards. Anything else? I did good? Obviously not. Yeah. <laughs>